Hi, I'm Deanna Jo, and welcome to my channel, Responsible Faith. If you've watched the previous parts of my story, um, you'll better understand how I arrived at this point. But I am, in a traditional sense, an unchurched Christian. I think it's important to define the word church um, up front. And in our current culture, we kind of define church as a religious building where Christians gather for worship. But scripture defines it differently. Church comes from the Greek word ecclesia, and it's made up of two parts. It's from the Greek word ek, which means out from something and to something else, and kaleo, which is to call. And so a proper definition would be that we are the people called out from the world and to God. And that would be me as an individual, as well as all of us as the body of Christ collectively. And so it's the, it can be the universal total body of believers who God calls out from the world and into his eternal kingdom. And so it's us, the people, the believers. It's not a brick and mortar building we attend. But for the sake of cultural understanding, I'll be using the word both ways in this video. When we moved to our current city over 11 years ago, we'd already done home church for a few years, but when we got here, we really didn't have any connections for that type of thing. So um, we just decided that maybe we would try to find a traditional church we could attend casually. You know, we had more options, move into a city from a small area. And we were mostly looking for Christian fellowship and some corporate worship, um, not so much preaching and teaching. Neither of us were baby Christians, and so we had learned to feed ourselves. And, you know, that actually should be the goal of every church and every Christian leader is to give people the gospel, see them convert, disciple them to the point where they're mature Christians so they can turn around and do the same thing. They can disciple other people. And um, as those disciples, they should be mature enough to feed themselves. And so, you know, I find the codependency that's encouraged in some churches where you just need the church, you need the pastor, you know, he's kind of the broker of your spiritual life. I find that to be very unhealthy and dysfunctional. Um, you know, once you mature, Feeding yourself spiritually becomes a habit you maintain, and it's much easier to do even today than it's ever been before with the access we have to information through the internet and, um, you know, study tools and stuff like that. That's not to say that if we had found a church here that we never ever expected to hear an encouraging word or a good teaching. But I'm just saying that wasn't the main purpose that we were looking for some place to fellowship. We did try several churches. Nothing just seemed like a good fit. We tried, we tried one Baptist church, mostly because it was close to our house, but, uh, and my health, you know, was kind of still an issue. But when we went that Sunday morning, I'll never forget it. You know, we went in, we were all dressed up. We actually had our kids that weekend, so they went with us. And it was like walking into the middle of something you weren't supposed to know about. Um, Everyone just looked at us weird, like we were intruders, and uh, it was super awkward. And then at the end of the service, when everyone left, there was this small doorway into the foyer where people would shake hands with the pastor, and so everyone was kind of bottlenecked inside. Oh, we would have taken a side door had we been able to find one, and um, not one person said hello to us. Um, some people just kind of glared at us like we were intruding. Um, the people were not friendly at all. And when we got to the door, the minister was super, super nice and super friendly. And he shook our hands. He was really happy to <laughs> see us there. And I just thought that poor guy, I, I just felt sorry for him. And we never went back, obviously, but we've even joked since, um, I wonder if he's okay. You know, so many people there were just emotionless and aloof. And, you know, those were the ones that weren't kind of glary and stuff. But it was like walking into the middle of a horror movie, you know, Invasion of the Body Snatchers or something. And we've driven by that church since. And I often joke and say, I'm a little worried about him. I wonder if he's okay. 
hopefully he's not buried out behind the church or something, you know, like it was weird. So that one wasn't a good fit. Um, we did attend services on the university campus for a short while, but that really wasn't a good fit either. In fact, a lot of the things that drew us to that church ended up changing just in the short time that we were there. Um, they had like a 20 minute period in the middle of their service where it was just open sharing and I found that to be the most encouraging part of the entire service. You know, different people would share a verse or a testimony or something that had just spoke to them that week. It was very uplifting. But that sort of fizzled out and then we liked the fact that they weren't affiliated with a denomination but then they kind of got a denomination from the UK that they aligned themselves with. I liked that they were on the university campus. I thought that made sense. It was great outreach. I mean you could reach the kids living on the campus but then they started this big fundraising project they wanted to build a building and I don't know it just it didn't click it, it wasn't right for us on the upside I will say my daughter did find a youth group there that she loved and she attended happily until she aged out but the church itself was not a good fit for us we considered a large Pentecostal church here probably one of the most prominent Pentecostal churches in our city but we had heard uh, right around the time we were considering them that a board member of theirs had just confronted a new convert to ask how he and his family were enjoying their few months of attending their church. And when the man said, well, we really like it, the board member said, well, maybe it's time you started supporting us with your finances too. I mean, I'm sure the man was putting money in the offering plate, but you know what it was. The tithe envelope with his name on it wasn't going in, and it was a big church. They were not hurting for money, and I just thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> just more of the same. So that was the end of that for us. Really, my health wasn't all that great at the time, and I was happy just to stay home and be left alone. You know, once you manage to heal from spiritual abuse and you gain a measure of peace, you actually become pretty protective of it. Eventually, we did make some connections, and we were part of a house church here in the city for a couple of years. Um, we've always had believing friends and family that we discussed scripture with, and we hosted occasional house meetings ourselves. So, you know, that's pretty much what we did happily for several years. And so then a few years ago, my husband decided that maybe he wanted to give casual church attendance one more try. And so we went to a small Nazarene church close to our house. The pastor seemed very sincere, and after attending for a few services, they dropped by just to get to know us. And we just laid everything out for them. You know, we told them about the spiritual abuse we'd seen and experienced. We told them we didn't believe in tithing, um, our views on pastoral authority, and even the necessity of church attendance. Um, and we were clear, like we just, were honest and said, look, we're not even sure we want to attend church regularly again, but we would like to kind of have the ability to pop in um, and we'd like some space, you know, just to be left alone. We won't be here every service, basically, so don't, don't expect that. And I remember them asking if we had any musical abilities <laughs> and we just kind of politely changed the subject. Scott had actually hidden his guitar before they came just so they wouldn't know. Because in our experience, involvement has always led to control. And um, they were really nice people, and we really liked them. But they knew exactly where we stood. And so we attended there about four months, and after telling them not to expect us regularly, they called every single time we missed a service. And that was pretty awkward. So finally, for us, the kind of the straw that broke the camel's back was they hosted a VBS, a vacation Bible school for kids, and they tried to assign us jobs. And, uh, you know, we're definitely not kids ministry people. And Scott told them that he wasn't available. He was away on course that week and he was traveling an hour and a half there and an hour and a half home each night. He wouldn't have even been home in time. And so they pressed and they kind of implied that they really needed us and so being a soft touch Scott kind of caved <laughs> 
and thought, well, I guess, you know, maybe we could just be helpers. And so that's what he told me. He said, well, we'll try on the nights I make it home in time, if Deanna's is feeling well, we'll try to come and, you know, we can just be floaters or whatever. We can be helpers. We can, you know, go around to the different groups. Well, on the first night we arrived, Scott found himself assigned as a leader of a specific age group, not helpers. And that left him, because he's a responsible person, that left him trying to leave his work meetings early, rushing home, no time for supper, with me ready and waiting at the door for us to even, you know, be able to make it to the church on time. And it was a stressful week. And close to the end of the week, Scott had rushed home to pick me up. It was the hottest day of the summer, I remember it. It was muggy, the church had no air conditioning. I was actually sick that day and the heat is not a good friend to me when I am sick. And you know, Scott was tired and he was hungry. And I can just remember the two of us standing at the back of the church, sweating and miserable <laughs> and kind of wondering how in the world did we end up back here again? You know, to be fair, they were lovely people and their approach was kind. But it was still the same issue, a lack of healthy boundaries, you know, not being not being willing to take no for an answer and and constantly pushing and pressing for involvement when you know people don't want that. And so that was it. You know, we never went back. That was kind of our our hope. We just figured if people that nice just can't seem to bring themselves to just give you space, I don't think anybody could. I'm a grown woman. I, I've been through a lot. I've raised a family. I pay my bills. I'm a responsible person. <laughs> and I'm not interested in fighting just to try to maintain control over my own personal life. You know, I like the idea of occasionally, casually attending church, but sometimes it's not quite that simple. In many cases, the moment you walk through the door, everything is geared toward pulling you into commitment and full participation in their church and all of its activities. And, you know, I haven't seen too many churches that didn't go into full recruitment mode once they meet you, even if you make it clear that you have no interest in jumping in with both feet, <laughs> except, of course, that one Baptist church. <laughs> they didn't try to recruit us. But, you know, when you do start attending most churches, the various uh, tools come out of the toolbox to try to kind of hook you. And, you know, for some, the strategy will be love bombing. They're super interested in you. They, they seem very drawn to you. They want to get to know you better. They want to hang out a lot. It's like instant friendships and community. You know, others will give glowing testimonials of how much they love their church and how happy they are, which, you know, hopefully is true, and that they want you to get involved because obviously you'll love it too. So that's the other hook, you know, obligation. You get hooked into being a participant, you're kind of there. If that doesn't work, some of them will resort to guilt in the form of, you know, misused scripture, Hebrews 10, 25 is a big one. And they'll make it seem like your faith's in peril if you don't attend a church building regularly. Not ever entertaining the idea that just gathering together doesn't have to look exactly like that. And then <laughs> sometimes if they realize that you're not that worried about your own faith and so that's not working, they'll exploit the fact that you're a good person who loves other people. And then they'll bring up, well, being a good example for your kids or your grandkids or your neighbors or your dog, <laughs> you know. Basically, you'll be ruining everyone's life and dooming them all to hell unless you attend church regularly and probably, preferably, theirs. And so, you know, guilt's an effective tool. All this to convince you to join their specific gathering. And it's quite manipulative. Leaving a church can be brutal, and a full commitment anywhere else after that is something that many of us are just not interested in. Now, some people do enjoy the structure and the setting, and, um, you know, that's great, but some of us don't. 
and it's a relief to be out from under it. And I, I find a lot of church members and pastors really don't seem to be able to comprehend that. Many of them feel that their way of doing things is kind of the only way. And if it's working for them, well, obviously it would work for everyone else. And then, of course, in extreme cases, some will even make it a matter of salvation. Either you attend church or you're going to hell kind of thing, which they have no biblical grounds for that. That's ridiculous. So my dad has compared leaving church to leaving a gang. If you leave, they'll make an example of you to scare the other members into staying and remaining loyal. Once you get beat out or jumped out, if you survive, when you recover, you will think long and hard before forfeiting your freedom to ever join another one. And you know what? He's not wrong in a lot of cases. I, I personally could not survive being beat out of another church. You know, while the Christian community does have some wonderful, kind, godly people, it also has some of the meanest people I have ever met in my life. And I think that contributes to people being happy to just live their faith at home in peace. There are various reasons people leave corporate Christianity, and some of them are spiritual abuse, and then the trauma that comes from that. An abuse of power would kind of fall under that heading as well. Money. I mean, money has become a god in a lot of churches, and, you know, there's a lot of waste, and the way that the Christian community has spiritualized greed is a big turnoff for a lot of people. Many churches' handling of sexual and domestic abuse has been absolutely horrific, and it has caused some very wounded people to flee the church in desperate need of comfort and healing and recovery, and that's disgraceful. There are mental and physical health issues that make it difficult to attend regularly. For, you know, for some people, it's just that simple. There's also the lack of evidence in scripture that gathering has to look exactly like our current version of corporate Christianity or church attendance. But I think the biggest reason for many of us is false teaching and control. And, uh, you know, you've got too many churches who don't even understand the basic gospel. They don't teach it properly. You can attend there for 10 years and have never heard it. You know, it reminds me of someone I knew who had told me recently they left their church. And, you know, when the pastor sat down and wanted to know why, like what they said, we don't even know if you understand the gospel. You know, we've attended here X amount of years. I don't think we've heard it once. And so... What are we doing in the Christian community when the gospel is not central to everything else? You know, you've got all these churches that require tithing, even though scripture doesn't for the, for the body of Christ in the New Testament church. You have all the bickering and taking stands over just foolish things that scripture is silent on, like dressing up for church. I recently saw someone, someone posted a, a Facebook thread and they were like, Call me old-fashioned, but I think a person should dress up when they go to the house of the Lord. And Oh, it was this big thing. And of course, you know, they throw in, if you were going to meet the Queen of England while you dress up, well, you're not going to meet the Queen of England, for starters. And I just feel like that was so unwise because it was on a public Facebook thread. Everyone read it, even people who were not believers. And all it did, in my opinion was show the partiality and the judgmentalism of the Christian community and it put an obstacle in the path of people who maybe were thinking that they would pop into church sometime. You know, dressing up for social events actually started around the late 18th century with the Industrial Revolution. Previous to that, only wealthy people dressed up and it was kind of as a sign of status and class. In fact, it's quite possible that in 1 Timothy 2.9, Paul was addressing that very thing. You know, they had wealthy Greek women who were a part of their fellowship, and they were dressing and fixing themselves up in fancy ways to flaunt their wealth and signal status when they met for public prayer. And you have to realize, you know, this was a mixed group. They would have had wealthy people, poor people, and then slaves. And so, you know, I feel like in that portion of scripture, Paul was telling them, like, tone it down. You know, that's not the point of this. We're here to pray and to come together in fellowship. And your excess is distracting from the point. 
You know, do you honestly think that the early believers all had the luxury of owning dressy clothes? Dressing up for church is not in scripture. And churches contend over stupid things like this. You know, you'll have other churches who will contend over accessories and they'll only allow them if it's like some horrid, gaudy brooch that pinned to your sweater, but not if it's like a simple necklace hanging around your neck. I suppose if you took the necklace off and pinned it to your sweater, it would be okay, just not worn the way it was meant to be worn. You know, I remember back in the 90s, there were all kinds of fashion tragedies in the 90s, but I can remember as good little church girls, we could not wear all those fabulous, like they were big clip-on earrings, and they were in at the time, but we could buy them and clip them to our shoes. So that was a trend for a little while in the Christian community I grew up in. And so, you know, you could wear them on your feet, but you couldn't wear them on your ears. So, I mean, what's the difference? You were still wearing them. They were still on your person. <laughs> like, I don't know. But, like, this is it. And this drives people crazy. And they just want nothing to do with it. And, you know, I, I just have to ask, are these the hills we want to die on with people? Because that is exactly what we're doing. The church needs to learn how to mind its own business and how to stop trying to do the work of the Holy Spirit in people's lives and just keep it simple. The gospel's enough and it's the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. And so I personally find it difficult to connect and identify with the majority of North American Christianity. You know, instead of keeping the gospel as the center, churches have fragmented off into their own denominations and organizations who often believe that they are the only ones who are saved. And they zero in on their differences as a matter of identity and pride. And I just don't like that. And it causes division in the family of God. And the Christian community has attached a stigma to being unchurched. You know, I think we need to find what works for us. For some, it is traditional church attendance, like it works for them and they like it. And, you know, maybe it's a matter of nostalgia. Maybe they just like the structure, but for whatever reason, it works. And for others, it's a more unconventional approach. Some of us are just not a good fit for certain formats. We simply do not grow and thrive in them. We are the body of Christ, collectively, and we need to love, encourage, and support one another wherever we choose to worship, you know, be it in church buildings or rented halls or cafes or in homes or even out in nature. You know, the gospel of Jesus Christ is our common denominator, not church attendance. Uh, John Newton is the guy who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, and I'm reminded of a quote of his, and it says, Let not he who worships under a steeple condemn he who worships under a chimney. In Acts chapter 2, they broke bread in houses. In Acts 5.42, they had open-air teachings in the temple courts. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, it just had Jesus sitting on a mountainside, teaching the crowds and his disciples. You know, they also met in large rooms and, and halls. Think Acts chapter 2 uh, with the upper room. Home church is also commonly mentioned in scripture with uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 19 mentioned in the one that Priscilla and Aquila hosted. Their style of gathering varied. They met for public prayer, they broke bread in homes, as well as even gatherings mentioned in 1 Corinthians 14 where everyone participated and contributed. Verse 26 says, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. And this was actually, this chapter was a rebuke because they had gotten way out of hand with tongues and uh, prophecy, and especially tongues. And Paul was admonishing them that they needed to be careful and orderly in how they use tongues so it wouldn't be chaotic and drive people away. And that's actually chaotic services is a topic I'll probably cover at some point. But scripture gives no structure or order for a church service. You know, there's no mention of owning a building. In fact, until about the fourth century under Constantine, church buildings as we know them didn't even exist. There's no mandate in scripture to have two services on Sunday, midweek Bible study, youth service, and Sunday school. In fact, if we're being honest, there is no mention of youth service or Sunday school in scripture. It just, it doesn't even exist. It was the job of parents to teach their children. There's no itinerary. 
laying out the components of a proper service. You know, you open in prayer, then you have song service, then you take up an offering, then you do prayer requests, then you have a sermon, and then an altar service where everyone prays, close in prayer, chat for 15 minutes, head off to your favorite restaurant. And I suppose, depending on what denomination you're from, you can throw communion somewhere in that order of things, unless you're Pentecostal. And any of the Pentecostal churches I ever went to, for whatever reason, I don't know, they seem to avoid communion like the plague. So is there anything wrong with the order of events like I just said them? Well, no, of course not. But it's also not biblical. In fact, there is historical evidence that points to it being patterned after medieval Catholic mass, which is said to have grown out of a blend of ancient Judaism and paganism. Look, in scripture, gathering was practical and organic at times. Other times it seemed planned and somewhat structured. We see no set schedule, frequency, or definite structure to be adhered to. They didn't build expensive buildings, apply for tax exempt status with the government. You know, there were no denominations run like corporations with extensive investments in real estate holdings. Their gatherings were not businesses. Nor did they form ministerial organizations that charged annual dues and fees. Nobody signed memberships or covenants. You know, and when you think about it, that all just seems quite far removed from what God was doing at that time, which was establishing his family, the ecclesia, the church. And the disciples and apostles were busy sharing the good news. They were not trying to build little empires. And what we see now is not modeled in scripture, nor does it look anything like the early church. So I kind of have a beef with denominations. Uh, in my, my opinion, denominations and organizations just divide the body. Are there safeguards built in? Well, sometimes, but I've also seen those safeguards evaporate and the system just turn into an old boys club full of nepotism and partiality where right connections have helped a lot of ministers avoid consequences of sin and even abuse. You're seeing more and more of that being exposed now. I mean, let's be honest. Members of a minister's family can pretty much get their license within any organization, no matter what kind of reprobates they are. So the idea that organizations provide credibility and accountability and screening, it's by far no guarantee, not to mention, the staggering number of modern-day Pharisees who stand in pulpits every week making the way to Christ difficult. And some might say, well, you know, the structure in organizations and denominations is better than no accountability at all, like, you know, the house church community or the cyber church community. Well, I don't know. In the house church community, typically each member of the group has a voice. And that's more than I can say for organized religion. The corporate church hasn't exactly been a bastion of honesty and accountability from what I've seen, even with all that structure in place. And since you can't point to it in scripture, I guess we judge its success solely based on results. And I don't really see any one being any safer than the others. Three issues built right into organizations are money, power, and status, and they're probably the three biggest problems in the Christian world. The house church community does have its own problems, but I do know that those three issues are usually dissolved in a proper house church. Typically, no money changes hands. You know, your giving is your personal responsibility unless everyone's pooling their resources to help with a specific need which I might add, you do have more money to do because frankly, you have no overhead. There's no specific pastor. You know, everyone's an equal contributor of their giftings. And so that kind of does away with the status and power as well. Now I do know that some house churches have just turned into honey, I shrunk the church situations with, you know, disgruntled people who longed for power in the church world and they're now seizing an opportunity to rule in their living room. But, you know, I would never recommend getting involved in a house church unless there's equality within the group. Even if one person hosts and leads, equality and room for all to participate is a must. It's perfectly fine to attend a church building and enjoy it, even one that's affiliated with a particular denomination, but you cannot tell people they're disobeying God if they don't. 
House church is something they did in scripture. Some of them were likely small, others were probably a good size based on what I've read. And, you know, they would often be hosted by the more wealthy saints. And so crowds could be anywhere from, say, 20 to 30 people to 100 people, depending on the wealth of the host. And architecture back then was different. They often had, like, big rooms for gatherings. I'm sure in poorer areas, they were likely hosted in more modest homes, and the groups were much smaller. And that was fine, too, because in Matthew 18, 20, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. And I'm also convinced that if they'd had the internet back then, they would have taken full advantage of it. I mean, you have to admit, the internet has changed the communication game. Now, I'm not saying people should leave traditional church. That's not what I'm saying at all. And I'm not saying that house church or cyber church is the answer. You know, if, if you think that there haven't been cults started by aggressive weirdos in living rooms or online, I mean, we all know better than that. Conflict and corruption can exist anywhere. People are just people. Um, we're never going to find perfection, but abuse, control, and corruption are three things that should never be tolerated in any of them. Lest you think I only have stories of people overstepping in the traditional church community, here's one that I observed in the house church community. Uh, we were part of a house church one time, and there was a gentleman, an elderly gentleman, who was probably the coolest person I've ever met in my life, and just like a godly man. And he had a heart for the house church community, and he would travel around all the different uh, house churches in, really, in our province. And he would just fellowship with them, and, and he loved it. He was so awesome and encouraged them. And so he would come back to our meeting and tell us all about it and it was fun to hear and so one person in our group said I think if you're going to be a part of one house church that that should be your family your fellowship your community and that you you know people shouldn't travel around to all these other groups I think you should just find a home group and stick with it and I can just remember thinking oh my word and I looked at Scott and he looked at me and we didn't say anything and it got really quiet and awkward and this gentleman said very kindly and firmly he said the day I'm part of a group that tells me where I can go what I can do and what other believers I can fellowship with is the day you will see me walk out that door and it was it was pretty glorious i have to say and you know that's the difference between the two structures in traditional church a minister will get up behind the pulpit and scream and holler about the saints not attending other churches and everyone just has to sit there and take it in a house church it was responded to and addressed swiftly as it should have been and it never came up again <laughs> and so that's kind of been my journey um, you know here I am a practicing Christian who has left the corporate Christian world and I mentioned back in part two that I would share what I do for spiritual growth and I've done various things over the years currently I'm part of a couple of zoom Bible studies my husband and I read study and discuss scripture like all the time my parents are students of the word and we discuss we host house services with family on special occasions and we have communion we've even had communion in our online groups I'm in a spiritual discussion Facebook group my husband plays the guitar and sometimes we have times of worship together you know and I'm not saying you have to do these things I'm just saying that that's what works for me and so you know other ways you can pursue spiritual fellowship and growth without traditional church attendance you know if that does become your path at any point even temporarily um, things you can do would be like watching teaching online reading books having times of worship you know not everybody plays a musical instrument sometimes it's me and YouTube alone and I go through it and I spend time with God and I have a time of worship and prayer and you know it's always good to get together with other people whether it be in person or online just to interact and talk and share one another's burdens and you know sometimes have prayer or discussion it's just for encouragement 
And I want to stress up front that none of these things are a matter of salvation. They're just some good practices to help us on our journey. I have to say that while I now believe that God led me out of the corporate Christian world, when it all started, I had no clue what was going on. I mean, I've always sort of felt like a misfit. I never really seemed to fit in the church world. I was constantly asking too many questions, getting in trouble, disagreeing with things. I'm I'm probably a little too opinionated and outspoken maybe, I don't know. I never really fit in the secular world, but I got along fairly well with just people everywhere, but I never really fit anywhere. And eventually I just kind of had to make peace with it. But I never imagined that one day God might use that aspect of my life. And you know, now I, I find myself interacting with people who are trying to sort through false teachings and you know, and or who have suffered spiritual abuse and many of them have come to the realization that they need to take a step back from church attendance and it scares them. Spiritual abuse leaves people stressed and overwhelmed and, you know, often needing to take a break to heal. And unfortunately, many have been preconditioned to fear that a break will destroy their faith and, you know, inevitably send them to hell. And because of harmful experiences, there are some people that just can't even walk into a church building. And there's others who can't make it through a church service without a panic attack. Spiritual abuse can cause PTSD in people. What if you've been threatened with hell and the devil your entire life to the point where you developed an anxiety disorder that causes you to fixate on trying to behave perfectly? What if you can't handle hearing hymns or scriptures? or certain styles of preaching without it triggering anxiety and feelings of panic or hopelessness in you. There are people who have been so badly abused by scripture and Christian culture by their pastors that they can't stand any of it anymore. And you know, God takes that very seriously. Read Matthew 23. More people are affected this way than you think. And because of my past experiences, if someone does come to me, you know, now I can say, Hey, I get it, you know. It's okay to take your time, catch your breath and heal. It's wise to pray and study and figure out what you believe and even take a break from church attendance. There is no sense in jumping from the frying pan into the fire simply because you believe that your butt needs to be in a church pew every week or your salvation is in danger. You'll be all right. You know, I've been out for 13 years and I haven't lost my faith and you don't have to either. And you know, when you've healed enough to move forward, then you can carefully decide where to go from there. And had I not been through everything I have and were I still attending traditional church regularly, you know, kind of making it work, I realize that I probably would not be as relatable or have the depth of compassion that I do for people who face these situations. And so I'd like to encourage you that, you know, God can bring healing to your broken places and then he can use you to help others. And it's been my privilege to hear people's stories and to talk with them and to pray for them and point them to resources and groups for support. And I honestly can't think of anything I'd rather do. That is the truth. You know, this is my heart right now. These are my people, you know, I get them. And it turns out I wasn't a misfit after all. I just hadn't found my community yet. Offering love and support to people who've been deeply wounded and abused by the church is what I believe that God has called me to do. And he's a God of restoration and healing. And that's how I got here. An unchurched Christian who still has strong faith in Christ. And so... I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit the like button. In my next video, I actually plan on wading into the concept of church attendance a little bit deeper and the fact that what we do now does not look like it did in scripture and so therefore people cannot manipulate you into having to be a part of what they're doing. Um, It's important to find what works for us and to pursue Christ and so Um, If you'd like for YouTube to notify you whenever I make a new video, you can hit the subscribe button and the little notification bell, and they will. So anyway, I hope you have a great day.